Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Beyond the Pain Light video. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Uh, just that this evening, as I usual Fridays, uh, praising God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is the mighty God, he is the God of the heavens and earth. Yes, you are God to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We serve a mighty God. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We worship your name, O God. You are good. You are kind. You are everything to us, Lord. Hallelujah. There are no words to describe you, Lord. <laughs> the Leon, the one who speaks and it, com it comes to pass. There's nothing that he cannot do. Hallelujah. There's no mountain you cannot move. Thank you, Jesus. If you said it, then you will do it. Thank you, God. <laughs> Thank you, God. What a great father. If you have said it. <laughs> You are mighty. Hallelujah. You are mighty. You are the one who clothes yourself with the firmaments. <laughs> you are the one who clothes yourself with the clouds. The God of universe, you are mighty. The God of universe, you are mighty. Hallelujah. It is worthy of our worship today. It is worthy of our adoration. The God of heaven and earth, the creator of the universe, the one who holds the universe in his hands, you are mighty. That's all we want to say today, Lord. You are mighty. You are awesome. Hallelujah to you, God. <laughs> God is good. Yes, by the blood that Jesus shed, we have overcome. <laughs> And we have been discharged and acquitted. Hallelujah. <laughs> he gave us the right to know his holy name. Thank you, God. Yes, he's the center of, center of power and strength. There is nothing God cannot change. We bless your name. <laughs> there is no mountain you cannot move, oh God. If you have said it, if you will do it. Thank you, Jesus. If you said it, you will do it. Thank you, God. Nothing you cannot do. You are not a man that you should lie. Hallelujah, God. I am, oh, you are mighty. Not like I am, oh, you are mighty. The God of universe. The God that holds the whole universe together, you are mighty. The God that creates the whole universe, you are mighty. We have come to worship you tonight. You are the one who cloaks yourself with the clouds. You cloak yourself with the firmaments. You are mighty. Hallelujah. You are the one who cloaks yourself, O oh God, with the clouds. Ah, you are so great, O oh God. You sit upon the throne on high. Heaven is your throne, the earth your footstool. You are mighty God. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our adoration. Ah, Lord God, you are mighty. You, you are mighty. You are worthy, O oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name, God. We honor your name tonight. We adore you, O oh God. 
Oh yes, Lord, you are mighty. Mm, you are mighty. Oh. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Mighty. Oh. Hey. You are mighty. Oh. Mighty. Oh. You are mighty. You are mighty, oh, you are mighty. Alpha and Omega, you are mighty. King of all kings, you are mighty. Defender of the defendless, you are mighty. Hope of the hopeless, you are mighty. Strength of the weak, you are mighty. The glory and the lifter of our heads, you are mighty. You are God alone, a mighty God, you are mighty. You will just declare tonight, God, you are mighty, the God of universe. That's who you are. <laughs> mm -mm. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We worship you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord our God is the mighty God. It is the one who creates the heavens and the earth. The one who sustains the heavens and the earth. He is a mighty God. He is greatly to be praised. He is worthy of our adoration. We we'll lift his name high tonight. We worship him. We thank the Lord who has brought us to this day. 20, 20, 22nd day of December. Hmm. When we consider the goodness, the faithfulness, the loving kindness, and all the expressions of God's love for us in 2020, ah, we can boldly, we can make bold to say, this God is mighty. The one who parts the Red Sea, the one who made water to flow from flinty rocks, the one who gave us springs in the, in the, in, in, in the desert, the one who made a highway in the wilderness, the one who moved mountains on our behalf, the one who, who has been a good shepherd, who shielded us, you know, and folded us in his, in, 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 under, under his shield. He is a mighty God. He's kept every single one of us. We are here on this day with strength, with life, with breath in our noses. And really, all we have to say is thank you. We thank God for bringing us to this day. And as we approach Christmas, I mean, it's just, um, you know, good to contemplate again on the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and the things that surround, you know, the surrounded the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and just, you know, little lessons from that, you know, to, to apply to our own lives. And one particular one that I want to um, encourage us and share with us tonight is um, the three wise men. <coughs> well, they could be more than the wise men. We really don't know how many there were. They came from the east, but we sang, we sing it in the, in the song. We three, we three the kings of Oriental. We think that, yeah, we are not going to um, delve into that. But these wise men came. And there are some things about them, I mean, that I've learned about them that really um, inspires me. And um, I learned lessons from them that I want to share with you that we can apply to our own lives. Even as we wrap up 2020 and prepare for um, 2021. And I just want to put in the captions this is worship God with your absolute best. Worship God with your absolute best. I mean, we've just recounted all the ways that God has shown himself strong to, for us, all the way he has demonstrated his power. I'm sure that if each of us would just pause and just make a note of all the different ways we have experienced the goodness, the faithfulness, the reliability of God, the dependability of God in 2020, we will have a long list you know, to share. <clears throat> and for that, we ought to praise him. We ought to bless him. We, we need, ought to bring to him our sacrifices of praise. We ought to come to his presence and worship him. I remember that uh, um, Christmas carol. It says, Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Because of our appreciation, you know, we, we, we fall and bow and worship and adore him because we, we stand in awe of him. We, we, we 
or we honor him. You know, what our appreciation will always fuel our adoration and our wonder will always fuel our worship. If we're in awe of God, in wonder of all the many-sided ways in which he shows himself on our behalf, he displays his glory in our lives, he fights our battles, he defenses, he sustains us, he maintains our life, he has kept us. Oof, it should spur us to worship. It should spur us to adoration. And so let's go to Matthew chapter 2. And I'm just going to read a little bit of this story. And uh, the place where I'm really going is verse 11. But let's uh, get some um, insights to what happened here. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of the King Herod. And there were some, and after a time, uh, some wise men came from the eastern lands, arrived in Jerusalem, asking, uh, where is the newborn king of Jews? We have, we saw his stars and his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. Of course, <coughs> excuse me. King Herod was deeply disturbed by such a thing. I mean, let's just pause at this point. They saw his star arose. They traveled miles and miles in hot desert. What dedication, what, um, what commitment to come and worship the king that has been born. They went, you know, risked their lives through the perils of the desert, traveling. God knows how many kilometers, how many days and months and weeks that it took them to cross through the deserts, traveling, just to come and worship Jesus. I think the first lesson learned for me is their, their dedication, their commitment, their intentionality. They were ready to, you know, they, they had a goal. They pursued it. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to see the newborn king. Hallelujah. Can we open the window? And they came all that distance just to come and worship Jesus. What extra mile would you and I go to worship the king of kings, the lord of lords? What will be the hindrance? What will hold us back? Do you know, to go all the way to worship our God, our King. What obstacles stands in our way? I mean, we're talking about worshiping God with our absolute best. And so, we jump down. Harold held a meeting. And, and uh, with, with a private meeting with them, and he learned as much as possible from them. And then he said to them, go search Bethlehem carefully for this child. When you find him, come back and tell me. They were discerning. You know, they, 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 you know, they had that information, yet they went on and then they found Jesus. And the Bible says that when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Their, their, their commitment, their service, their journey was joyful one. I mean, the psalmist says, come into his presence with joyful singing. This man, they were filled with joy when they saw where the star stopped, when they arrived at their destination to see Jesus. And the Bible says, they entered the house, saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Such was their joy of seeing Jesus, who they have traveled so far to come and see. And they expressed that joy in worship. They, <coughs> they were caught with wonder. They bowed before Jesus and worshipped him. But it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. This man did not come to worship empty-handed. 
that for me I just blows my mind I did not come to worship Jesus empty-handed the Bible recorded that after they worshiped him bowing themselves down the next thing that they did was to open their treasure chests not one their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold frankincense and myrrh gifts gifts from their chest which they prepared in advance they were not forced they had already determined that they were going to worship God Jesus with everything they spent they, they spent so much time they devoted their time they prepared a you know treasures to bring to come and worship their the newborn king I like the way that Matthew expressed their joy he says they were overwhelmed with joy our our worship must be with joy I mean how can we say we appreciate what God has done for us and who he has been to us and there will not be joy that accom you know that accompanies it there will not be an expression of joy that ah what manner of man is this Jesus who has done so much for me who left his throne on high the prince of peace the king of kings and is took down to take the you know the, 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 the form of man just for you and I it should bring us such joy contemplating on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and then the way they paid homage to him and the way the king prepared honestly I can write in a piece of you know on the lessons that I have learned from this man and how they inspire me their joy with worshiping we with the praise meaningful you know every single gift they gave to him had a meaning, had a significance. Gold representing his 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 royalty, the myrrh, the frankincense. I mean, these are real spices. They, were, they, did, they didn't just give just anything to Jesus. They gave him precious, meaningful gifts. They gave him their absolute best, the best of what they heard. That was what they gave to Jesus. And I believe that you and I can be like this wise man and you know that and give him gifts of ourselves our absolute best we open up the treasures of our heart and worship in adoration and we pour out unto Jesus unto God out of the depth of our souls in appreciation and in awe of him there's so many lessons we can learn about the way this man worshiped Jesus with everything that is precious their time their energy their treasures time talent treasures we can use to worship God the giving of ourselves in any shape, form, or manner, is an act of worship. We we see that expounded in the Bible in so many ways. And you and I, we have a God-given mandate to give to God and to others as an act of worship. And I'm going to show this to us in the Bible. Proverbs three tells us. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth. Give him the very best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your bands with grain and your vats with overflow with good wine. What portion of your substance do you give to God? The left over or oh, just anything do you contemplate do you prepare to 
give to God. And this is what um, we're learning here in this chapter. <coughs> and I'm going to read um, this uh, Proverbs to us in different translation to amplify it. The easy to read version says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first part of your harvest. Then your bands will be filled. That the filling of your bands, your, you know, is beyond your what you can harvest. It's God that multiplies. And your barrels will overflow with wine. The Passion Translation says, Glorify God with all your wealth, honoring him with your very best. You know, I say, pondering this, I ask myself, how can I give God the best of my talent? How can I honor and glorify God with the best of my talents? How can I glorify and honor God with the, with the best of my time? How can I honor and glorify God with the best of my treasures? <clears throat> I cannot give the leftover of my energy to God. I have to spend time with God when I'm active, when I, I mean, when I am, you know, fully awake and, you know, the, at, at the best time to do that is in the mornings for some of us, depending on the kind of work you do. It means that I have a time that I dedicate to be in God's presence and fellowship with him. I dedicate time to serving him as I serve others. And we will see that as we go. It says that <coughs> glorify and honor God with every increase that comes to you. Then every dimension of your life. I just love the way the Passion Translation amplifies this. If you do that, if you give God your very best, if you honor God and glorify him with the very best of what you have, it says every dimension of your life will overflow with blessings from an uncontainable source of inner joy. Whoa! Every dimension, every sphere of our lives will overflow with blessings. Praise be to God. This is just telling us how important the giving of to God of our best is an act of worship. The idea, you know, as <clears throat> if we go, the idea of giving being a, 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 a part of our worship is even expanded upon in the in, in the New Testament, and we will see that in Second Corinthians chapter eight. In fact, both Second Corinthians chapter eight and chapter 9, is worth reading in full. And we see how Paul speaks to us about giving to God and giving to others in honor and in service of God. Um, I'm going to rapidly go through these uh, chapters because I want us to see the message that is hidden there for us. This isn't uh, from Second Corinthians chapter 8, starting from verse 1, I will just read and jump some of them as I go. And I encourage you to take time to study it at your own quiet time. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness have done for the churches in Macedonia. Now he is boasting about the churches in Macedonia. It says, they were tested by many troubles. They were very poor but they were filled with abundant joy that which overflowed in rich generosity. I mean, it looks like, how can these two be in the same statement, in the same phrase? Very poor, many troubles, yet filled with abundant joy, which overflowed in rich generosity. People who are very poor, who are facing painful experiences, who are facing severe persecutions, are filled with abundant joy that's overflowing in rich generosity. 
<coughs> excuse me, for I can testify that every that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. I mean, what changed the perspective of these people in Macedonia? In the midst of their painful experiences, in the midst of the challenging situations that they were going through, they had joy that could not be contained inside of them. And the, that of that joy flowed a desire to be generous. And as we read in, the, uh, in, in Proverbs, that every dimension of your life will increase with blessings that flows from an uncontainable source of inner joy. Their source of joy was not material, based on their possession. <coughs> Excuse me. It was not their material possession that gave them joy. It was not worth um, everything being quiet and peaceful that gave them joy. Their joy came from their relationship with the source of joy. And when you are joyful, when you are happy, you will be a generous person. It says they gave far more. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gifts for the believers. These people were ready. <coughs> Excuse me, to give of the little that they have so that others who are in need can also be blessed. Boy, I know that we can look back into 2020 and some of us will say we lost jobs. Yes, it's absolutely true. We lost opportunities. Yes, it's absolutely true. But I will say it over and over again that none of us has been left empty handed. There is always something that we have, whether time, talent, and treasure, that we can joyfully give out to bless those who are, because there will always be those who are more, more needier than we are. And so, they even did more than we had hoped for their first action. What stimulated, what motivated their, their joy and their generous giving came first by giving themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to. And so it went on to, let's go to verse 7. Since you excel in so many things, in your faith, in your gifted speakers, knowledge, enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you also to excel in these gracious acts of giving. This is what Paul is encouraging us. Excel. In the gracious act of giving, as an act of worship unto God, giving him your best, irrespective of your current circumstances, there is a way you can worship God with your best, with your giving. So let's go on. <clears throat> In verse 11. Um, let me say, no, but no, but verse 9, you know that the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was very rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that we, through his poverty, can become rich. We are wealthy. We are rich because of the finished work on the cross at Calvary, the exchange of Jesus. He took our poverty and gave us his wealth. He became poor that we may become rich. So he went further and said in verse 10, he says, here is my advice. It will be good for you to finish what you have started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give and you were still the first. You were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let your eagerness show. <coughs> Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in the proportion to what you have. It didn't say that you should you know, have to go and cut corners. But he says, from what you have been given. And it was last week I was sharing on the um, Aaron Olumisa page that we give it, what everything we have has been given to us. The breath in our nose was a gift from God. Our, our giftings, our skills, our talents, our treasures. They are all gifts from God. And what God, what God is saying to us in his word is to give in proportion to what we have received 
of him. I want to read that this um, two verses again to us um, in the Passion Translation. It says, so these are my thoughts concerning this matter. It is in your best interest. Since you have missed such a good start last year, both in the grace of giving and in your longing to give, there is a longing. When there is a will, there is a way. There is a longing to give and the grace came upon them to be able to give. It starts with a longing that we desire that we want to give unto God as an act of worship for all that he has been to us, for who he is to us. And there is that longing. God will provide the grace for us to be able to um to 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 do the work of giving. You should finish what you started. You were so eager in your intentions to give. So go do it. Finish the act of worship according. Finish this act of worship. What is this act of worship? The giving. Finish this act of worship according to your ability. To give. Given is an act of worship. Given is an act of worship. And those who follow Jesus Christ should excel in the grace of given. Given is an expression of the love that we have for Jesus. Lord loves a dwelling and a cheerful giver. I mean, consider the joy with which the wise men gave to Jesus and worship him. They, were, they didn't hold back. They were not stingy. They gave openly, freely, cheerfully. Because God loves a cheerful giver. A given will result in praise and thanksgiving to God. If we read through the entire verse, we will see more and more of this. Now, considering our uh, given should be a natural response, to God's gracious gift to you and I. If I've been so blessed, I should be willing to be a conduit of God's blessing to other people. Freely I have been I have received, freely also I gave. Considering what Jesus has done for us, why shouldn't we want to give him the very best of us? I mean, I I, I value the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. The breath that he gave me, the ability for my lungs to expand in praises to him, their precious gift for me, for, for, to me. And I mean, for having been a recipient of such amazing grace, I am obligated to fulfill that mandate of worshiping him with my giving. And you know, one of the things that we need to understand about biblical, you know, a biblically based giving is that it has to be a joyful act of worship. If our giving is not joyful, if it is with grumbling, if it's if we feel as if we are being forced, then we are not worshiping. Worship has to be with joy. A, you know, a, a given the honors God is one that we give with joy. And here is the thing. We are, have that responsibility and the privilege of being a part of God's sovereign plan by ma you know, making investments into the kingdom of God. Our given as significant kingdom investments. And I know that God owns no man. Those who give, he will bless them in return. Interesting thing is that you may ask, am I going to go to heaven to go and give to God? Am I going to find Jesus to go and pour at his feet again and give him my gold, my mirror, my frankincense? <laughs> Jesus clarified that for us, how we can give to him. If we look into Matthew 25, Matthew chapter 25, hallelujah. Yeah, Matthews chapter 25 um, and we scroll down to um, verse 40 Jesus would tell in a, 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 a parable about um, those who you know have to separate in at the final judgment when he has separated when he's gathered all into his presence the Bible says that he will separate the people as sheep and you know from the goats right 
and then he will place the sheep at the right hand and the goat at his left hand and jesus will say to those on his right hand come you have blessed i mean you who are blessed by my father and so he's speaking to those ones that he has uh, separated from the goats that you are blessed by my father come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the creation of the world for i was hungry you fed me i was thirsty you gave me drink I was a stranger you invited me into your home i was naked you gave me clothing i was sick you cared for me i was in prison you visited me i'm reading from, from i have started from verse 31 and then the righteous ones will say lord when did we ever see you hungry and we fed you or thirsty and we gave you something to drink or a stranger and we showed hospitality or naked and give you clothing when did we ever see you sick or in prison jesus and visited you and in the, the creme of the creme is in verse 40 he said and the king will say i tell you the truth when you did this to the least of these my brothers and sisters you're doing it to me when we go out to reach out to all the people that Jesus mentioned there, it says that we are doing it to him. When you feed the hungry, Jesus says you're feeding him. When you care for the widow, Jesus says you're doing it to him. When you take care of the orphan, when you take care of the homeless, and especially now, even the more now, for many of us who have the opportunity to have roof over our heads, there are many more out there who have lost their homes. The people, the food lines in some countries are increasing. And Jesus says, when we release ourselves to be his fingers touching lives, the legs going out there, the warm you know, welcoming all the strangers that we are doing it to him. In fact, I love the way that uh, the Passion's translation says that you have a special place in my father's heart when in obedience to his instructions and to honor him, you tenderly care for those who are hungry, thirsty, homeless, sick, in prison, and those without clothes. There must be somebody out there in need that your widow's might will make a difference for. We are demonstrating God's love for us and our appreciation for his goodness when we allow ourselves to be the, his fingers touching God's, other people's life for good. When we allow ourselves to be the one to bring joy to others especially in these times caring for the poor and the needy is lending to god who will repay us that's what proverbs chapter 17 uh, chapter 19 verse 17 says it says every time you give to the poor you make a loan to the lord don't worry you will be fully repaid for all the goods that you have done because Every act of kindness, intentional kindness to others, <clears throat> in every way we reach out to those who are in need. The Bible says that we are loaning to him and he will, he will not owe us, he will not owe any man. He will reward, he takes notes, he pays attention. And then Jesus went, and then Paul went further. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter, chapter 20, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, and in verse 35, he was saying, actually, if we back, back a bit to verse 33, he says, I've never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. We go beyond our own needs to meet the needs of others. 
It says, and I have been a constant example of how you should help those in need by working hard. Poor says, we help those who are in need. We work hard. We, we go the extra mile. I mean, look at this wise man that came all the way from far. That was hard work. Trekking in the desert. We work hard with that motive, with that desire to be, to be, you know, to be able to help those who are in need. And you should remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Hmm. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's in another ex um, translation. I've always shown you that you should work just as I did and help people who are weak. I thought you remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will have greater blessing when you give than when you receive. I have left you an example of how you should serve and take care of those who are weak. For we must always cherish the word of our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us giving brings far a greater blessing than receiving. You see, the hand of the giver will always be above. Jesus says that we shouldn't just always be receiving and receiving and receiving in honor of him as an act of worship. We should willingly, with joy and devotion, give to others. We are far happier giving than receiving, the Bible says. And not even one of us has been left empty-handed. I said it before and I'm repeating it again. Our generosity is best determined by what we give, even when we have little. I mean, if we look at uh, Mark 12, we see the story of the widow. And how Jesus acknowledged what this widow did. She is a widow. She was poor. Mark 12 verse 41. She was a widow. She was poor. Jesus sat near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowd dropped in their many, many rich people put in large mounds. Then a widow came and dropped in two small coins poor widow and Jesus called his disciples to him and said I tell you the truth this widow has given f more than all the others who are making contributions they gave a tiny part of their surplus but she as poor as she is has given everything that she had to live on our appreciation our adoration it expresses itself in our giving even when we have very little to us and to our name. This woman should encourage us that there is nothing too little to give. It is not the volume. It is the heart with which we give that matters. It is the proportion of what we give him that matters. The rich only give out of their surplus. But this woman sacrificed out of her poverty and gave to the Lord all that she had to live on. She gave everything. Everything. What our hands do with money matters. It shows where our heart is. Since where our treasure is, there will be our heart all the time. What is our greatest treasure? And that is really, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, the heart of the matter, the premium that we put on the material things that we have. Excuse me. And let's look at, um, I mentioned earlier that Second Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, they give us biblical principles about our giving and how we ought to give God our absolute best. See, if we look at um, 
right from the beginning. So Paul is making an example of the Macedonian church again. We spoke about them earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is now concerning ministry to the saints. It is superfluous for me to write to you again, for I know your willingness about which, for about which I boasted of you to the Macedonians that they, you know, they were ready a year ago. So we should always be ready to give. In verse 5 says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, and it is to, it, that it may be made ready as a matter of generosity, not as a grudging obligation. God doesn't want to. I mean, if we are worship, if given is an act of worship, it's not something that we can do grudgingly. It is not something that we can, ah, they say we should do it, we do it. It has to come to a heart that is willing. And that's why in chapter, um, in, in verse 6, it says that, This I say to you, we who sow sparingly will reap sparingly, and those who sow bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one give as he proposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace to abound to you that you always have insufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. I mean, it's a cycle. We worship God with our treasure, with our absolute best in our time, our, our talents, our, 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 our resources, our treasures. And we give to him. Then he gives cause his grace to abound to us. So that then we're able to overflow and give more. And then God blesses us the more. And then his grace abounds again. And we go and it keeps going in a circle like that. It's, an, it's a circle of gracious giving. We give his grace abounds to us. We have more. We give more. And that's the way it ought to be. Because we're worshiping God. We understand that everything we have is of him. And we just bring it to him as an act of worship. And even when we cannot give it to him physically, we can you know, invest in kingdom's work. We reach out to the needy. We reach out to those in, you know, who, who are homeless. We make it our business to be a conduit of God's blessings to all the people.